Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our local Plan Watch Eastern Update webinar. We're delighted that you've been able to join us this, this lunchtime for a review of progress with local plans across Essex, Suffolk and Norfolk, and some of the opportunities and planning issues arising from them. My name is Sam Metzen, and I'm a partner in the Bidwell's planning team, and I'm very pleased to be joined by my colleague Ian Hill and an esteemed panel of guest speakers who we will introduce to you shortly. Before doing so, and to set the tone for the discussion, no doubt like most of you, I'm coming to you from my little study at home where I've spent most of the last 10 months, and I have to say, it's starting to get a bit monotonous. I'm sure that's an experience that's shared with many others on this webinar, and so we hope that the next hour will provide an opportunity to step back from the emails and our day-to-day -day workloads, grab a coffee, stop worrying about our increasingly, lock increasingly dodgy lockdown here, unless that's just me, and take stock of where we are across the Eastern region in strategic planning terms. The many exciting things that are happening across the region as a result of strategic planning, and perhaps some of the things that aren't going quite so well or have fallen foul of the current local plan system. We'll be thinking about how those issues might be affected by changes proposed by the government at the national level, but we're not going to focus on the planning white paper per se, as we know, quite frankly, that's been done to death by now but we will be picking up on some of its key proposals and key themes whilst looking closely at the specifics of current progress in Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex. We'll be kicking off with a short presentation from each of our panellists before moving on to a panel discussion and Q&A session with the audience. You can submit questions to the panel via the Q&A function on screen and please feel free to start doing so as soon as you're ready to give us plenty of time to consider them. But before we get on to the main part of the session, we obviously need to introduce our panel uh, and I will now bring them into the discussion and ask them to introduce themselves by saying a few words, perhaps kicking off with my fellow host from Bidwell's, Ian Hill. Over to you, Ian. Thanks, Sam. Uh, it's interesting to hear that you're still referring to your room as a study. I think I started referring to mine as a cell about six months ago. <laughs> Um, for those of you that don't know me, uh, my name's Ian Hill. I'm a partner in the planning team at Bidwells. Um, I'm usually based in the Norwich, of, uh, Norwich office. Uh, and I primarily provide planning advice covering Norfolk and Suffolk. Um, I think that's probably about it. And I'll just hand over to Andrew to introduce himself. Thank you, Ian. Andrew Tabachnik, Planning and uh, Regulatory Council, based at 39 uh, Essex Chambers. Uh, you're all going to be subjected to a few words from me later on, uh, so I won't uh, overdo this introduction. All I'll uh, say is to remark that uh, I'm quite impressed that I look only a day or two older than that photo on the screen, which must have been taken about eight years ago. So for me, at least, lockdown is, is clearly an agreeable exercise. Uh, and it's probably Selena next. Uh, so the esteemed members of the panel will begin again. Thank you, Andrew. Uh, it's Selina Cahoon here from 39 Essex Chambers. Um, I joined from number five chambers almost a year ago. So um, I have yet to fully experience the, the full delights of, of a 39 chambers um, full on party, which apparently they're quite, they've got quite a reputation for. That's why I joined. Why on earth have I not been able to have this? So, well, it's a, it's a great, that's a great, <laughs> the worst part of lockdown is, is, to, is the absence of that. Um, welcome to my sitting room. Um, I only get to be in this for part of the day because my son, uh, when he awakes, actually uses it for his university studies, sort of, including slash games. Uh, and forgive me if there are any noises in the background, uh, I have some, some guinea pigs, but I will endeavour uh, to, to keep them quiet. I will be talking about local plans. Can we see them? Uh, well, I, um, I, I can, I can, um, I can present one to you later, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> be interesting to get their feedback on the discussion sooner in due course. Yeah, they, they might be able to come up with a better white paper. <laughs> well, we'll see. They've got, they've three of them. They may, they may not agree. Um, <laughs> let's move on to Jeremy now. Thank you, Selina. So, Jeremy Potter. Um, I'm the special planning manager at Chelsea City Council. Um, and I'm responsible for local plans and policy and strategy and affordable housing, those sorts of things at, um, at the City Council. And I come from Chelmsford and I'm in my cell as well, 
taking Ian's um, um, lead. Um, I'm joined by by two dogs, Bella, my cocker spaniel, and Finley, my black Labrador. So if there's any sort of barking in the background, I do apologise. Sometimes when the door goes, then there's a a, a great a load of activity comes from the two canines. But um, hopefully um, that might, um, well, hopefully it doesn't scare Selene and Skinny Pigs. Thanks. <laughs> I feel like I've disappointed the panel that uh, although my golden doodle was uh, groomed over the weekend, uh, I, I haven't been able to entice him upstairs to my uh, cell. I think he must have found a mirror somewhere and be admiring himself uh, there, which he is actually quite good at. Excellent. Well, it's good to know we've all got some company uh, with some furry friends. I don't have anything in the house, but I do have four chickens outside, which hopefully will stay quiet during the course of this. But We'll see how we go. And Jeremy, it looks like you've got um, a picture of Champs and Railway Viaducts on your wall. Is that correct? Oh, well spotted, Sam. Yeah, yes, absolutely. Very good picture. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> I could do side copy if you want. <laughs> <laughs> no, very well painted if it was yours. Um, but no, in all seriousness, I think Ian and I are very pleased to have um, a great panel of guests with us from one of the leading barristers' chambers in the country and also to get the perspective really from the planning front line, so to speak, from Jeremy, um, who is you know, a big part of one of the, the largest and most proactive planning authorities, I think, in the whole region that we're looking at today. And no doubt, Jeremy, you're, you're pretty proud of having been able to adopt a new local plan just this time last year, and one of the first authorities in Essex to do so to get a, a fully up-to-date local plan planning up to uh, the mid-2030s, I think it is, isn't it? Yeah, okay, so now that we'll hear more about that in a moment. Um, so that's who we are. Um, and yeah, just to reiterate the structure of the session coming up, um, each of our speakers will be giving um, a three minute piece to the audience uh, on a specialist subject before a, um, a question and answer set was well, before a panel discussion and a question and answer session uh, ensues from there to pick up on many of the key themes raised in those pieces. Ian and I will be giving an overview to set the context uh, for the discussion, an overview of what's happening with local plan progress across the three counties that we're looking at. Staying at the sub-regional level, Andrew uh, will be discussing issues around the provision of garden communities with particular reference to North Essex garden communities and perhaps some of the lessons that might be learnt for garden communities plans that are now coming forward or proposed in Norfolk. Um, and uh, Selena will be looking at issues around the duty to cooperate, the government's proposals for that, um, and really uh, any ideas that we might be able to come up with for enabling local authorities to cooperate more, more effectively uh, on local plan preparation, before Jeremy provides a, a more local perspective, providing an update on planning delivery in Chelmsford following the adoption of their local plan last year. So perhaps without further ado, we'll get cracking on that. And Ian, I think you're going to kick things off with an overview for Norfolk. Yeah, thanks, Sam. I do feel as though I should probably introduce my cat just so he doesn't feel left out. But I suppose, as you say, at some point, we probably do need to, to move things on. Um, you'll be pleased to hear that I'm not going to go into detail as to where each local authority has got to in relation to the preparation of their local plan. Uh, because I'm probably very sure that you've all read the latest local plan update that was issued by Bidwells before Christmas. Um, for ease of reference, you've got some plans on the screen. Primarily today, I'm just going to focus on the headlines in relation to local plan preparation that occurred since the white paper was published last August. Um, the principal headline, in my view, relates to the Greater Norwich Local Plan, where production has been accelerated since the white paper was published to ensure that transition arrangements can be taken advantage of. This has resulted in the Reg 19 version of the local plan being published this week rather than in August of this year, as was previously proposed. The Greater Norwich Local Plan team are proposing a hybrid approach which seeks to take advantage of the transitional arrangements whilst having regard to the proposed new system. What this means in practice is that the Reg 19 version of the local plan accommodates 5,000 additional homes to those required by the 2014 household projections, reflecting that this is an area of growth and providing a housing supply buffer of 22%. In addition, there's now a policy in the Reg 19 version of the local plan that makes it very clear that new settlements will be considered as part of the next local plan to be produced under the new system. And we'll talk about that as we go, for, as we go on. I think in summary, the Great Norwich Local Plan team have, in my view, adopted a very proactive approach to ensure that the emerging local plan 
as the best chance of being found sound and that there is a smooth transition between the old and new planning systems. It also limits the chance of there being a period of time where they don't have an up-to-date local plan and therefore could be at risk of speculative development. However, on the flip side, the publication of the white paper has resulted in delays in the preparation of Breckland's replacement local plan. As I'm sure many of you will be aware, Breckland's local plan was adopted back in 2019, albeit it was subject to an immediate review of policies, include, uh, including those relating to housing need and supply. Rather than the partial review that the local plan um, was required to be, uh, the, lo the local plan inspector required, the council advised last year that they intended to embark on a full review of the local plan immediately. However, this work has now been paused following publication of the white paper, and the council have written to the government asking for guidance as to how they should proceed. As far as I'm aware, Breckland is still waiting for a response from the government, and you can therefore see how the publication of the white paper has caused some delays for local authorities, as well as a period of uncertainty. I think this is particularly relevant for Breckland given that the policies relating to housing supply will be out of date and therefore the tilted balance will apply from November 2022. Just turning briefly to Suffolk, there's been less activity and I think that's probably a reflection of the advanced stage that most of the local plans have reached in the county. Suffolk Coastal adopted their local plan back in September 20 and Mid Suffolk and Baber concluded their Reg 19 consultation just prior to Christmas and they're looking to submit in the coming months. We may, however, see the impact of the white paper on West Suffolk's local plan preparation, whilst they completed a Reg 18 issues and options consultation toward the end of 2020. As it stands, they're not due to submit their local plan to the Secretary of State until 2023. Accordingly, I think there's a, a potential that they will have to revert to a preparation of the local plan under the new system. And we'll no doubt get confirmation on that as we go forward. Um, so that concludes the brief summary of Norfolk and Suffolk, and I'll now hand over to Sam to pick up Essex. Thanks, Ian. Oh, sorry. Yes, uh, there we are, slight technical glitch there. But uh, yeah, just a quick overview of what's happening in Essex. Um, I think it's fair to say we're doing fairly well in Essex now uh, with the preparation of local plans. And you can see using the, the traffic light system shown on our plans, the green ones show the, the plans that are more advanced. And we're in a much better place than we were uh, 12 months ago. We now have five uh, fully up to date and adopted local plans in Essex, at least as far as strategic policies are concerned. Uh, this time last year, only Malden had an adopted plan, uh, but last May, Chumpsford adopted theirs. Harlow adopted theirs just before Christmas and Colchester and Tendring actually adopted their part one shared strategic plan uh, in the last couple of weeks and Braintree are due to follow uh, uh, in, within the next month um, following the successful and eventual completion of the part one local plan examination. There are a few uh, exceptions to that rule as shown quite clearly I think on this plan. Uh, first up, Uttlesford. Um, it's now nearly a year since Uttlesford withdrew their local plan from examination following significant soundness concerns raised by the inspector on the plan submitted for examination. And I think most people in the industry are aware there is you know, there's an ongoing policy vacuum and far, a significant five-year housing land supply deficit in Uttlesford, which provides an opportunity for uh, the landowners, promoters and developers on the webinar. Uh, but perhaps uh, isn't necessarily going to result in the best plan-led development there over the next couple of years. And then there's also exceptions in South Essex, and I know we'll touch on this in more detail later, uh, but in South Essex, uh, Thurrock, Rochford and South End are a bit behind the curve, uh, whereas many of the other South Essex authorities are now making good progress and have exam plans at examination. Uh, Thurrock, Rochford and South End um, are still really at the issues and options stage, and Thurrock aren't anticipating adopting a plan until 2024, which will be actually 10 years since they started preparing it in 2014. And I think there's probably a couple of key issues there that we'll talk about in more detail during the webinar. The first is there's been a lot of discussion around uh, the preparation of a, a joint strategic uh, plan for South Essex, which each of those authorities would need to abide by. We've been waiting for progress on that for some time, uh, but that doesn't appear to be going anywhere fast, quite frankly, in the latest intelligence we have is that that's likely to perhaps take the form of a non-statutory spatial framework in due course. And most of those authorities will continue with their local plans and won't have to have a great deal of regard for it because it won't have any statutory weight. And it's obviously also the case that all of those authorities are in the green belt. And I think that clearly provides 
perhaps less incentive uh, for those authorities to take forward up-to-date local plans because they're protected from speculative planning applications where the plans aren't up-to-date and there isn't a sufficient housing land supply by that Greenbelt designation. Uh, but the other big news in Essex over the last few months, which I'm sure most people will be aware of, but just to set the context for our perhaps slightly more uh, in-depth discussion that will follow, particularly with Andrew's piece, uh, is the outcomes of the, the North Essex shared part one local plan, uh, which proposed three very large scale garden communities on the boundary of Tendring, Colchester and Braintree districts. Uh, two of those garden communities were found sound, sorry, unsound, and only one of those garden communities uh, to the east of Colchester has been found sound and will be moving forward. Um, and Andrew, I know hopefully that sets you up with a, a reasonable segue, uh, perhaps to take it from there to discuss issues around garden communities, particularly in North Essex in a bit more detail. Thank you, Sam. It, it, it does indeed. And I don't know if this was the plan, but if you could uh, leave that uh, map up, that'd be very helpful. Yeah. So no North Essex update in three minutes. That's what my sheet says. Gosh, it's, it's very difficult for a barrister to do anything other than clear their throats in three minutes. Uh, but I'm going to try and give the highlights of progress with the North Essex authorities emerging uh, local plan, possibly stretching to four or five minutes. Uh, as you will uh, all know, and as Sam has just reviewed, the North Essex authorities are uh, tendering Colchester and uh, Braintree. Uh, back in the dim and distant past, 2014 or so, they started work on a joint plan, which has become part one of the submitted and partially approved now documents uh, to address housing and employment needs uh, in their area. Uh, after three years of preparatory work, the plans were submitted for examination in about uh, 2017. And after two rounds of hearings, various preliminary letters from the inspector, substantial additional work from the North Essex authorities themselves, uh, we finally know the fate of part one. Uh, in essence, the housing requirement figures to 2033 have emerged unscathed uh, and employment requirements have emerged mostly uh, unscathed. Uh, by contrast, as you can see uh, from this plan and as Sam has mentioned, two out of three of the proposed uh, garden communities uh, have bitten the dust and uh, been airbrushed uh, from history uh, by way of main uh, modifications. Uh, and what is perhaps significant and relevant to the fate that they have uh, suffered, as well as their individual uh, difficulties around uh, viability and uh, infrastructure uh, provision, is that each of these communities was slated to provide 2,500 new homes within the plan period, which had been set to 2033, a long way off when work started. <clears throat> only 12 years away, obviously, uh, now. I'll come back to that point. There are a number of uh, observations to be made uh, about the failure of two of the garden community uh, projects. Uh, first, a call to developers everywhere, in particular those listening in uh, today. There is now an opportunity to make up the plan period shortfalls created, as you can see in Braintree and uh, Colchester, cumulatively around 5,000 uh, units. Uh, doubtless, those local authorities are going to have to start for purposes of their uh, Section 2 plans to look to allocate small and medium uh, greenfield sites, uh, possibly, uh, at least in some cases, uh, including parts of the former garden community proposals, although uh, that's a more realistic proposition in respect of the Colchester Braintree uh, proposal rather than the other one, which is somewhat out in the middle of nowhere uh, in uh, planning terms. Uh, so developers, get your maps out and dust off your option agreements because there's an opportunity uh, here. Second, uh, no doubt as a reaction to what is now a trend, unfortunately, of garden community proposals being found unsound, 
one of the white paper proposals is to replace the soundness test with an overarching test of sustainable development, sustainable development, uh, embracing what the government describes as a slimmed down uh, assessment of deliverability, uh, while also abolishing the will not be mourned sustainability appraisals. And we don't yet have uh, details uh, of this particular white paper uh, proposal beyond the headlines in the white paper. Uh, personally, uh, I am skeptical that these sorts of changes go far enough or will make any difference in relation to cases like the North Essex uh, garden uh, communities. Uh, and nor do I think that as yet, they really address the area where change could be meaningful. If the question is asked whether these are sensible proposals for a 12 year uh, plan, uh, I'm not sure that the wrong answer was given. The inspector found the proposals beset by fundamental uncertainties uh, on viability and transport infrastructure. Uh, and without getting into the weeds uh, of those matters, uh, one reason he no doubt uh, did that is that, of course, the adverse consequences of endorsing proposals with problems of that nature uh, is that you likely reduce the extent of actual housing delivery because there will have been insufficient allocations. Alternatively, you get speculative development on five-year supply grounds. Alternatively, uh, there's pressure for partial releases uh, from within proposed garden communities, but without the transport, in transport infrastructure that's a fundamental component of the final product being sustainable. Nor do I see myself how the slimmed down assessment of deliverability, unless that in reality means no test uh, of deliverability, uh, makes any great difference, at least for garden community proposals. Uh, and if, uh, as the white paper specifically says, the ultimate question is one of sustainable development, it's hard to see why it's sustainable to endorse an unviable proposal to the exclusion of other allocations. Ultimately, it seems to me that one needs to change the question one is asking, but in a slightly different way. There needs to be a special arrangement for long-term proposals, which will come forward far into the future. The plan period being addressed could be extended with inbuilt reviews, ensuring that long-term proposals are not put forward in a way that competes with other short and medium term proposals and setting out with clarity what infrastructure requirements or affordable housing contribution must be met. It will be much easier to find that there is a real prospect of significant delivery within a 25 or 30 year period than a 12 year period. The idea would be to find a way to give plan endorsement to a proposal because we all know that matters snowball favorably once this occurs, making it easier to address viability and transport links, link uncertainties in the future. So the white paper is on the right track, but I think there remains work to do until we have a fit for purpose method to endorse putting garden communities into a plan. Uh, and without further ado, uh, I hand over to Selena for an update on duty to cooperate matters. So very quickly, um, I will give a quick dash through the duty to cooperate because it'd be probably more interesting, at least <laughs> to hear, not, not to hear me going on about the duty to cooperate, but also to get into a discussion as to how it's evolving um, in, in this part of the world. Um, uh, it is well known that um, I think from a very early stage all of us recognised that the duty to cooperate was going to be one of those unintended consequences. Um, it was uh, clearly to replace the top-down arrangements that had been um, the, 
the political uh, bane perhaps of uh, the government um, uh, 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 and that there was a, it was, this was seen as a means of replacing uh, that imposition from uh, local bodies who had regularly rejected uh, what structure plans had been put forward. And, and, and then subsequently there was never acceptance, at least from my experience in, in uh, Eastern England, uh, of the way that the regional body, bodies were producing um, figures to which um, local plans had to comply. Um, the nature of uh, the duty, on the one hand, it, we were told at one point in the NPPF it was not to agree and people still say that. However, as we know, the, the text of the NPPF has changed. But on the other, uh, if you don't have to agree, you still have to uh, it can be a killer if you do not demonstrate that you have complied with your duty. So it, it, it has that rather uh, peculiar nature and we can all think of examples where it, it did finish off a, a number of local plans uh, and resulted in cases like the St Albans one where it never seemed to, um, it never seemed to end. So where are we now? Well, the MPPF uh, was reworded uh, uh, at the beginning of last year, uh, and at least a bit before that, um, uh, and takes a much more um, hands-off tone, I think, compared with where it was, uh, uh, and leaves, in effect, the, the detail of how to comply uh, with the MP with PPG, um, which goes through uh, in detail <laughs> how to uh, set out your statement of common ground and how you must keep that updated and, and uh, uh, produce it at various stages and make sure that it's published. However, uh, having set that out, the PPG then goes on rather softly to say um, uh, that um, if, you, if you can demonstrate, uh, however, that in, in trying to reach your, your duty and how to, in, in having to, to comply with it, you contradict the policies of the NPPF, that in itself will give you reason to back off from, from uh, any particular issues that may have arisen. So you still have this huge weight to comply with it, suggestions of how you do so in detail, but thereafter it just says if you don't comply with the NPPF, um, that, that may be a reason uh, not to address it in the way that you may well have been expecting to. Um, where are we uh, in uh, Essex? Well, you would have thought that the SEP was a good example of how to comply with the duty to cooperate. Um, but as we know, uh, very recently, uh, it, uh, there has been uh, um, news from H MHCLG saying that, uh, in fact, that this, this is not a very good idea. Um, so uh, uh, the, um, the news that came through, um, I think it was South End, and people can tell me if I'm wrong, that, um, uh, that, that work should in effect cease on, on exploring the SCP as, uh, as an approach, uh, uh, and that um, there will not be this kind of strategic framework. There may be alternatives addressed to it, but um, that as a, as, as, a, as a sort of paradigm of how the duty to cooperate might be addressed is seems to be now gone. Uh, Basildon have had their knuckles wrapped slightly. Um, uh, they have been asked by the inspector looking at their current plan to, to uh, explain why they haven't dealt enough with Brentwood. Um, uh, uh, we'll see what comes out of that. Um, uh, and in terms of, of, of uh, any other uh, authorities that are currently in the process, um, at least Chelmsford has had its plan adopted. Uh, Castle Point um, is due apparently to submit, um, we'll have to see what happens with that, uh, uh, and um, in general terms um, I think we're at a point where a, a lot of authorities are looking to the white paper to see what on earth comes next and we're going to, we're going to look um, I think at th that issue and the, the abolition of the duty to cooperate at, at a later point. So that's my little short piece on the duty to cooperate. Over to you, Jeremy. Thank you very much, Selena. <clears throat> so I'm just going to, I think, wrap up uh, the these kind of short segments with um, just a bit of context in relation to delivery in Chelmsford. Um, 
So for those that don't know, and I'm sure you do because it's the centre of the universe, but um, it's about 180,000 population. It's right in the middle of Essex. We've got our city status in 2012, so we're, we're the only city in Essex. Um, we've got a large rural hinterland, so we're a big, big city, about 110,000 people with a big rural hinterland with a, a smallish um, new town to the south uh, called Southwood and Ferris. And about a third of us, third of our area is Greenbelt. So that just gives you a bit of that kind of spatial uh, context. We are growing fast and we have been growing fast for a number of years now, decades really, actually. And we, we in turn about a thousand homes a year plus that are coming out and about the same amount of jobs as well. So it's quite a good correlation between jobs and homes in Chelmsford, which provides opportunities, which I'll uh, go on and talk about a little bit more. So in terms of the plan, We've always had, um, so through successive administrations, Charles has always had a really positive approach to plan making. And I was looking back, having to think about this talk, and I think we go back about 35 years of pretty much having continuous plan coverage over that whole period. And I think that is really important in terms of being able to deliver the aspirations of uh, uh successive administrations and also the community as well because there's a lot of consultation engagement that goes on through the process of preparing, <coughs> excuse me preparing a, a local plan and and also i think we've had a good mix of regen sites so urban regeneration sites so heights in chelmsford for someone that's may have not come to chelmsford for uh 20 years um you would see a very very different skyline than 20 years ago. So some, some urban regeneration schemes and some greenfield sites as well, a mixture, a good mixed portfolio of different types of sites, which I think always is good um, for resilience in terms of delivery. Um, so after uh, the local development framework being, um, being introduced and taken us quite a long time to introduce that, lots and lots of different documents, thankfully we've replaced it with one single local Plan, which is a great um, thing from our perspective, I think, um, in terms of just having one document that covers the whole area, having strategic policies, um, our DM policies, all of our plan, policy map coverage all within one document. And that was adopted as in May 2020 and goes to 2036. So we've got quite a nice time, got quite a nice plan period, plan horizon over 15 years, which obviously is the, is, is the aspiration uh, within the MPPF. And within that period, we are, um, well, within the period of the plan, it's actually delivering about 23,000 new homes um, and about 100,000 square metres of commercial. So significant growth really happening um, happening in Chelsea. And we do have the obligatory garden community, which everyone seems to need to have. And we've got that actually allocated within our local plan. And we've got our garden community policy within our local plan, which we're, we're, we're very very happy about. So we haven't got those AAPs or any site allocation documents. We've just got everything in our in our um, in our local plan um, as adopted. And I think also what's important is that just taking Andrew's point, our guard community is essentially a, a, a large urban extension, um, which in deliverability terms is quite different from a freestanding settlement um, without having um, you know a lot of that infrastructure. Uh, in place. So really um, what we've been successful at is attracting funding. So we've got HIF fund to try fund a new train station and a new uh, bypass. Um, but really what I wanted to really touch on and probably come on to the panel discussion was that it's all good, well and good having the plans, it's actually delivering. So our policies say that we have master plans, we need to have master plans approved, we have a, a separate process to to agree master plans that go through a separate consultation. And what I think we feel is absolutely key is that you have that, that interface between a local plan allocation and an outline planning permission. And having a master plan, and I know the government, uh, you know, through the consultation on the MPPF, that through the design uh, um, elements, but the master plan is seen as a really important structuring element that sets down some of these principles within the local plan policy and makes it deliverable. Um, and also gets engagement from the local community about the detail, because that's what everyone wants to know. They want to know about the detail. Red line's great, but they want to know where things are going uh, within, within 
so we've made good progress on that. We've got a couple of uh, those master plans now have been uh, fully approved and we're waiting. We've got outline applications on some of our, um, our greenfield sites as well. So um, I think there's, you know, in terms of progress, I think that interface between delivery and local plan is important. And I'll just finish off because I know we're running over with the fact that although our local plan was relatively straightforward, um, it still took five years from the first consultation to adoption. So, or, and that was a relatively straightforward local plan. We didn't have some of the issues that Andrew and Selena have been, have been talking about. But I think I'll leave it there for a moment, Sam, and hand you back. Forgive me for interrupting, Jeremy. Did, did you have Greenbelt releases to deal with as well, or did you have enough land outside the Greenbelt to uh, meet needs? Had enough land outside the green belt, Andrew, and that was a big, um, a big uh, opportunity for us because um, obviously we, if you if you can't just do a mini green belt review, you've got to do the whole lot. Um, and um, but we had we had plenty of sites outside that were more sustainable when the SA was done in the first place. And and still the process took double the amount of time that the government's uh, expectations uh, have now moved to. Yeah, and but in our defence, I would say that we three years, you, you three years is. A, I don't think you need to defend it. It's <laughs> oh no, more than thirty and, months. I'm sending you on five years. Comment <laughs> about thirty yeah. months as a realistic target. Well, yeah. I would say that three years is you need three years to do a plan. So essentially, we always do. We've always done an issues and options, a preferred options, and a draft plan. And each one of those takes a year and then you submit it but the thing is i suppose um i would say that we submitted it in 2018 <laughs> and had a relatively straightforward examination but we didn't actually we you know by the time all of that process happened the inspectors reports the main mods the consultation on the mods you know the essay on the mods all of that takes time to come back and then get adopted um, and also you know a global pandemic as well. I, I mean, it seemed to me that the only realistic way one's going to uh, hit a 30 month target, even with all the resources in the world or making all the developers in the world pay for promotion of their own uh, schemes, um, is if you basically know what the answer is at the beginning, and then you're just working through and justifying that answer. But there's, there's no opportunity to realise that you're heading down a false path or an undeliverable unrealistic path and then and then move on to something else I, I the other thing, of course, is, is the the validity of the consultation process will mm. i mean however wonderfully you you imbibe all the the relevant technical assistance and digital communication that you can people need at least some time to respond <laughs> read this <laughs> uh, that is not a consultation <laughs> uh, and i'm afraid if, if 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 there are no proper if there is no proper consultation politically it won't work because the the government will be heavily criticized by its base as well as those who who are not in its base but also there is you know as Andrew will, will at least be able to back me up on this one. There's an awful lot of law on proper consultation, and and being able and, and simply cutting it short uh, and and not actually responding in an appropriate or any form of appropriate way will get you in trouble in the courts. So it's where on earth this thirty month period came from? I, I don't know. Uh, just kind of to pick up a point as well that. Andrew touched on there about potentially developers having to sort of pay to promote sites through the local plan. And I think some of the sort of literature I've read is seen or suggested that you may have the equivalent of planning performance agreements put in place. Now, I suppose one for Jeremy, is that something you could see you as a council using going forward? Uh, then also, is that essentially a fair process? And you could argue that those people who have the sort of the larger pockets can sort of throw more money at land promotion, uh, particularly at a time when we're meant to be, or the government is saying that we need to be promoting small and medium sized developers. Is, is that is that a fair comment? Is that, you know, how would you approach that? Well, it's interesting you say that actually, because um, we're having a discussion ourselves about, about that kind of whole dynamic going forwards in our review, because nothing stops. We're gonna have to, we're starting thinking about our review. Um, 
I think in principle, um, well, and we are, um, for large scale development, we will be seeking some kind of, you know, similar to a pre-app process for our um, strategic land availability sites that will come forward and people uh, want to promote. I don't think that's, I don't think that's that different from what's happened in the past in the sense that, you know, large strategic promoters will, will invest heavily and the smaller ones probably don't. I, so I wouldn't say that the process that the councils might introduce in terms of some kind of um, charging structure, I don't think that necessarily would would, would have a situation which would be particularly unfair. Also, it depends on what the charging structure is, obviously. Um, but I think in principle, I don't think, I, I think it is fair for a council to be asking promoters to contribute towards the council's resources because it takes a lot of resource to be able to um, to be able to assess all of those sites. So I think in principle, I think it's a fair a fair starting point. And and we all know that without uh, the expertise uh, of a professional developer who knows what they're what they're doing, promotion of a big site is going to end up being a complete disaster. But I, I take Ian's point in relation to smaller uh, sites, and there's uh, a distinct risk uh, that smaller sites, which don't don't need or benefit all the time uh, from such uh, developer or promoter uh, involvement, will will get squeezed out to the detriment of a sustainable plan. I think this comes back to the fact that um, to enable housing delivery. Um, over the whole of the trajectory period, you need a mixture of sites. And I think if local authorities, local authorities need to accept that the small sites make an important contribution and small and medium sized greenfield sites make a really important contribution to housing delivery. And um, putting all of your eggs in one basket is a dangerous path to go down. Even though you get the economies of scale for the infrastructure, that um, I can understand why authorities do that. Um, you need to have a mixed portfolio to enable you to, to continue to deliver. Just picking up on that, Jeremy, um, you've obviously been very successful as an authority, um, as you highlighted in your piece on taking forward successive uh, local plans and keeping them up to date. And I think in the last 10 years, you've, you've implemented two local plans, which is great to see, particularly as Champions is my hometown. So it's very pleasing from a professional and a personal point of view. Um, would you say there's anything in particular that's led to Champs of being successful in that regard in terms of political leadership, um, the constraints of the, the area or uh, resources that you have in place, skills? Um, is there anything you can really you know, pin your hat on that we can use as a lesson perhaps elsewhere? I'm, I'm afraid I'm probably going to say it's a mixture of all of those things. Mm. Um, I don't think there's a silver bullet in, 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 in relation to local plan production. Um, I think. Um, obviously, having a, uh, a positive, engaged administration, having the local plans sent front and centre, so I'm, I'm sure lots of people have heard that before, but it is very, very true. Um, so it's senior management, you know, from the chief executive and the leader, knowing exactly what the plan is and being completely engaged in that. That's a, that's a prerequisite. Um, and then, um, obviously, um, I think there are some geographical factors that help us as well. But, you know, we're we're a good, we're just far enough out of London to be uh, separate and not a dormitory, but we are close enough to be able to get in and out really quickly and easily pre-COVID. So, um, so that helps us. We're not all green belt, which helps us as well. Um, and also, you know, we've got a really good. There's a really good quality of life. I think. I think one of the things that um, um, we've been, we have been good at is being able to show that we're bringing forward infrastructure as quickly as possible. So, for example, on our our development in northeast Chelmsford at the Beauty and Channels development, a secondary school, a primary school, and secondary school has come forward a lot quicker than what would actually be required in terms of the school places and being phased um, in terms of its opening. And I think that provides local people with. Um, you know, obviously they always want more and don't we all, but I think it provides a plan led approach. Um, so I think it's a mixture of a number of things that comes together, some within the council's control, some probably uh, a fortune of, of, of its geography. 
And just on the secondary school uh, point, I mean, from the developer perspective, um, although I'm sure developers wouldn't like the upfront uh, expenditure, the reality is it makes the houses more attractive because you already know that you're moving to a place uh, with educational facilities um, having been provided rather than just on the promise that they might be at some point in the, in the future. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I mean, one thing I was interested in was the kind of um, the whole um, looking towards, and I think I can't remember if it was Selena or, or you, Andrew, that was talking about the fact that the time scale and that it, it seems like it's or if something's already decided and it's a process to validate what's already been decided. And, and this sustainability appraisal was always supposed to be the check and balance there to make sure that it's an iterative process and make sure that you can actually see see that happening in, in, in practice. I, it's just interesting to see whether that sustainable development test is going to actually fulfil that um, that purpose and, and, and whether actually we are going to get iterative plans or plans that have already or, or plans that have been decided and justified um, uh, after afterwards, really. Well, the ambition seemed to be to, as you can see from the white paper, to, to, to clear out the assessments to make it some form of, you know, a sort of rule of thumb test, I don't know. Uh, and um, that in itself, whilst, as you say, it, it's, a, it's a means of being able to progress properly, I think it's going to cause, again, I think it's going to cause more problems than, than, than than as expected, and also as the ambition of the white paper to avoid that. So, it is. I'm, you know, the problem is if you, if, as, <laughs> as you've been doing planning for so long, which I have, you, you know, this is it, every time you get a new administration that wants to make a change, which of course, to, to some extent, could, could, you know, is admirable, of course, but inevitably, when you start tweaking with things like sustainable assessment and strategic you know SEAs you're going to get you're going to get a knock-on effect that that won't achieve the principal aim uh, and it's going to be very difficult I think going forward to see what how on earth they're going to, to you know to, to put back the good stuff um, by creating um, you know this whole new system I mean I, anyway but um, We've been asked some questions about uh, badly behaved uh, local plans, <laughs> where, uh, in terms of, of you know the, those sites that are kept within um, local plans over years and years and years, why that is a, a sensible approach. I don't know, Jeremy, whether you have any. I'm sure Charles Chelson doesn't take that approach, but I just wondered whether you had any view on that. Um, well, I do. You should remove them. Like, and um, we've done that. So, um, first of all. You can't guarantee that all sites you allocate are deliverable. That is, an, you know, there are sometimes situations that come forwards. Um, we've had a situation where, with the last site that wasn't developed in our last local plan, just was not coming forward uh, for one reason or another, and so we we dropped it, and um, and that's gone back to countryside beyond the green belt, and. Um, and that's, uh, there's no point in continuing to promote sites that just won't come forward. It doesn't help us. It doesn't, and we would have to put it in a trajectory to say that it's going to come forward on a certain day. Um, I don't want to be in a situation that appeals. Luckily, we don't really have too many five year um, housing land appeals, but I don't want to be in a situation where year on year I'm saying that yes, inspector, this site will come forwards when I know it probably won't. It's not defendable. Mm. <coughs> Uh, there's a related question uh, that, that I've seen on the chat, uh, which is about sites in that uh, category remaining for years and years uh, in the five year supply calculations uh, and why why that happens and what the routes to challenge that uh, are. Uh, and uh, there the position is that one is always entitled under the uh, relevant policy and guidance as to what a deliverable site is to um, challenge something that's been wrongly included and say that it's been hanging around for years and years uh, and the history as well as the future prospects um, 
mandate the conclusion that this site still doesn't have a real prospect of coming forward within the five year uh, period. And if either the authority on uh, reflection or the inspector or secretary of state on appeal agree, uh, then the site will come out of the five year uh, calculations. And if, if, if that creates a deficit, uh, obviously we all know what the paragraph 11 consequences of that hopefully uh, will be. Sam, do you, do you want me to take this other question on uh, five-year supply issues as well? Yeah, if you could, if you could, and then perhaps perhaps we can just finish on the subject of infrastructure, if we can, uh, Andrew, picking up on your the pieces in your presentation, a couple of questions we've had had since then. But we'll absolutely, well, I'll on. let others. I don't want to hog things, so I'll let others deal with infrastructure. But just the other five-year supply question, just to read it out quickly: uh, How do we get planning authorities and their committees to accept that five-year targets are not caps and that sustainable sites that result in these targets being exceeded should also be considered for approval where benefits they deliver exceed any resulting harm. Uh, and the answer is that there are plenty of uh, appeal decisions out there, inspectors, but also the Secretary of State, uh, which make that point. Uh, a floor, not a ceiling. That's the phrase uh, often uh, used. Uh, and there are court decisions uh, which endorse the lawfulness of that approach uh, as an application of uh, Section 38.6 and effectively a basis for going against, say, uh, an old uh, plan. So um, the learning is out there, the materials are out there uh, that can be used to persuade authorities or planning decision makers that that approach is a legitimate one. Uh, and once you've done that, obviously, then you need to win the argument uh, that um, your benefits outweigh whatever the harms uh, are. But that, of course, is a separate question. And hopefully, Andrew, that's something we're going to be working on together soon in the not too distant future with a particular project in mind. But uh, yes, I, I don't know where the question came from. It'd be interesting <laughs> if it was from our client. Uh, I think there's a reasonable chance that it was actually. <laughs> um, uh, yes. Sorry, sorry Ian. I'd say a question probably that's linked to some of the ones that are coming on the chat. But probably to, to yourself and Andrew, because it is linked to, to infrastructure provision. Given the experience of um, North Essex and the fact that the Greater Norwich authorities have said that they are now going to consider new settlements in the, the next local plan, what are the specific lessons that could be learned to ensure that the, you know, the mistakes of, say, North Essex aren't repeated? Yeah, um, perhaps I'm happy to kick that one off. And perhaps, of Andrew, if you want to follow on. Um, it seems clear to me, and I think you picked up on it in your, in your piece earlier, um, the real, the really big downfall, the most significant issue, I think, with the North Hastings Garden communities was the certainty over the delivery of the infrastructure, and that just wasn't in place in time to be able to give the inspector confidence that those garden communities could come forward within the timeframes anticipated and to deliver the amount of development that was expected and that that plan was reliant on. Um, the one thing that particularly jumps out to me, well, there's probably two things actually. Uh, the the, the uh, west of uh, west of Colchester Garden community at West Tay was reliant on the A12 and the A120 both being diverted, and the inspector had made clear that that was an essential element of those garden communities being found sound, um, and the funding just wasn't there. Um, the government actually awarded through the Housing Infrastructure Fund the A12 diversion works. But the A120 was still a big question mark when the um, local plan examination reconvened uh, about 18 months ago. So it was quite clear, I think, at that stage uh, that, that that proposal was going down. So I think I think it's absolutely critical to make sure that that infrastructure is in place early, that the funding is there, and to probably be realistic about the timeframes that these garden communities are expected to come forward over. And I think picking up on Andrew's point, perhaps if you if you plan much further ahead for these very large scale, very difficult to deliver proposals, perhaps beyond the plan period that you're actually working towards at the moment, but get the principle accepted, you can then work with the government to get the infrastructure funding in place once they have some kind of status in that plan. Um, I don't know if Andrew, if that fits with your your perspective, perhaps you can add to that. No, it, it does it entirely. I mean, I think um, w without getting out a magic wand and trying to think that that's the way to solve these problems, the starting point is to be looking for sites where your transport infrastructure burden is manageable. If you can find that, then it's usually quite easy for things to fit into place. If, on the other hand, you're going to be dependent on uh, huge uh, road 
uh, infrastructure changes, plus new routes for purposes of sustainable uh, bus links and so on, which again was uh, an affliction of both the failing uh, garden communities uh, in, in North Essex, then you're going to be pushing a very big boulder up the hill for a very long time, at least while conventional thinking applies uh, to the rest of the plan issues. And that, I think, is really a reference back to the point I was making in my three or maybe six minute uh, set of comments that um, sometimes one just needs to refocus what the question uh, is. Lawyers know that going off to court. If you can define what the question is differently from your opponent, oftentimes the answer uh, flows. Uh, and I think that some thinking will need to be given uh, both with our current system, but also any new system that's to be uh, introduced uh, as to uh, whether plan periods and things like that can be manipulated so as to, uh, or changed, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, uh, so that the proposal can fit in uh, with what you've defined your plan period to be. You, you then, if it's a long-term arrangement with currently loads of uncertainties uh, affecting it, you want to find a way in which it can be part of the plan, um, but not having the adverse effects of taking something else's place. But equally, you need to make your plan period long enough so that you don't end up uh, in a Winchfield Heart District situation. I know that's far away from here, but the point of principle applies. There, the proposed garden community at Winchfield failed, at least for now, on the basis the council was trying to promote it for, if you like, after the plan period and without any attempt to demonstrate need for it now or in the future and without any attempt to extend the plan period. So it really didn't sort of fit on. It was just an attempt to pull a fast one and get that one through before anyone was really focusing on it. So there's lots of things to think about. The reasons that the North Essex communities uh, failed are not the only reasons that these sorts of uh, proposals have failed. And really what's, what's uh, needed uh, by Norwich is, is to make sure that they've covered all of those bases before they, as I say, then fit the plan around what it is uh, they can deliver on and how they can then spin uh, or address future uncertainties as not anything that needs to uh, disable uh, or derail the particular proposal at this time. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Uh, I'm conscious that we are uh, just about bang on our hour. Um, so sadly, I think we've got a few questions we haven't been able to answer, uh, but perhaps uh, if people want to talk to us about that separately, we'd be very happy uh, to chat about it. Um, but I think we probably need to wrap things up and enable people to get on with their day. Um, but before we do so, um, I just probably, it's very difficult to provide a summary of such a, a wide ranging discussion. But I think if there's one thought for the day, um, I think it's perhaps important to leave with is that I think we're making some good progress across the region that we're looking at now with strategic planning. And there are a number of authorities that have been very successful uh, in taking forward local plans and allocating quite ambitious proposals in their areas, uh, which will be effective and deliverable and deliver good results for, for their community. So I think, I think we need to congratulate the successful authorities and just you know, be aware of the fact that the current system is working in certain circumstances and perhaps just leave the question, do we want to turn the planning system upside down in the way that the planning white paper is suggesting, or should we be focusing on those uh, increasingly rare areas uh, where, where local authorities are struggling to get plans in place and look at the particular issues there, particularly I would say from an Essex point of view in those Greenbelt Authority areas where um, they do seem to have uh, you know, special uh, circumstances, which mean the implications of not taking forward local plans uh, are, are quite different to the non-Greenbelt Authorities. So I won't try and answer that one, uh, but um, we'll leave that one for everyone to think about. Um, but yeah, before we go, we need to obviously thank our guest panellists. We are extremely grateful uh, for Jeremy, Selena and Andrew to be joining us today uh, and for all of our um, audience for joining us. It's been a really uh, well attended event. Uh, so we're delighted about that. Um, I think all we need to say is please stay safe, stay well um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone.